McClendon marches down the dugout steps with first base. McCutcheon's throw. The runner breaks to the plate. Here's the throw. Wow. He is out. The buck goes win. That ball's in well to left center field. Back toward the track. You are listening to the North Shore 9 Podcast. Follow them on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Also, make sure to watch NS9 Live every Thursday on Twitch and help support by becoming a patron. Let's go, Bucks! Yo, yo, yo. Welcome to NS9 Live. I, of course, am your host, Anthony DiNardo. With me, as always going forward, is my co-host. We got Jim Rosati on here from the North Side Notch. Jim, our second Thursday. Look, we have a beautiful stream going. If you don't believe me, I can see it right here. It's it's coming in good. We have audio. We have video. What's going on? Yeah, how's it going? It looks like uh, the operation. We're we're actually professionals now. It looks like. Well, well, I mean, let's not go that far, Jim. Come on, man. <laughs> We've been zero for three on streams, so we're far from professionals. Yeah, it's been a rough. At least start now we look like so amateurs. Far. There you go. For real though, so it's been a week yeah, since no. we've talked. Um, yeah, it was good. What have you been up to? Anything? Anything new in your life? It's it's hot here, here in uh, Kentucky. I don't know what it's like down there in Florida. It's um, yeah, it's been pretty hot here too. Yeah. But uh, no, that's about it. Just it's, trying to it's been hot. Just trying to trying to stay negative when it comes to uh, the coronavirus. So that's very good. And as well as well as the pirates. As uh, I've we've just been informed. Apparently, Austin Meadows tested positive. So pirates won the trade. Pirates won the trade. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a friend tweeted at us and said, "Pirates pirates knew this was coming when they traded them." So <laughs> clearly. Uh, yeah, so it's definitely been hot here as well, but I don't know, man, just, it's like a bunch of nothing still. There's nothing to look forward to, nothing to do. There was Pirates baseball there last night. I don't know if you, you caught the stream. Um, I, I watched a little bit of it. I can't just sit there for like an hour or two watching, watching it, but, um, no, been able to check it out a little bit, seeing the highlights that they post on Twitter. <laughs> Getting exciting. We're we're what we're what now? Uh, eight days away from opening day, real yes. baseball. So that's awesome. One week from today, when next time we're streaming, Jim. Actually, I think there will be a baseball game going on, and uh, yeah, it'll be the Yankees yeah. and, and Nationals happening. And then yeah, it'll be going on when we're yeah, that's true. The very next day, yes, Pirates take on the Cardinals. Can't wait. I, uh, it's weird because like I was so excited about the draft. I'm sorry, the draft, the game being on last night. But as I mentioned with the draft, we had our NS9 live, NS9 draft. Jesus, I can't talk. See, a bunch of amateurs. I had our draft <laughs> last night. Shout out to Reed, our uh, commissioner of the league. But So we had the North Shore 9 draft last night at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. I think it was 8. So yeah, I caught like the first hour. And like you said, it was it was really weird. I mean... There's no fans, but also just wasn't like a real baseball game. Also, like the presentation, nothing. The game itself lasted, I think, two hours. So, um, yeah, like the part that I was able to catch, I don't really pay too much attention to because, again, like in the draft and trying to, I don't know. I just hope, like, even though we know there's no, no, no fans in the stands, once the season starts, Jim, I hope like it resembles a bit of baseball and not that presentation that we saw <laughs> last night. Yeah, I mean, I, I would imagine that once the game will start, you know, it'll be it'll be like real baseball. It'll take us maybe a little bit to get used to the three batter minimum rule or right out of the bullpen, stuff like that. But right. uni- universal DH. But for the most part, it's going to be baseball. And even though there won't be any fans, there'll be artificial crowd noise. It'll it'll be nice to see. There it is. Ryan Platt's already calling it Musgrove. No hitter opening day. So take that Cardinals. <laughs> We're one game towards our 15, as Mark Madden said. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going 15 and 45 this year. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe them, the them Orioles. The might. Tigers, Tigers or Orioles, I guess, have a shot. See, that's the thing. If the Tigers do, that bodes kind of well for you know the Pirates because mm-hmm. that gives them that chance. But 
I don't know. I don't know. It also means everyone else they're going to be playing against, though, will also be winning. That's true. That's very true. What a terrible division. This Central. <laughs> I'll tell you, man. <laughs> we're about to get into it, too. So the preview, we're going to go ahead and talk about our National League over and unders. Um, and uh, we also have a little video. Let, let's talk. I mean, we've talked about this new pitching coach, right? Oscar Marine comes in over. He's, you know, he's younger. He's a little more analytical. He's no Ray Searage, right? There's not a game within the game, Jim. You know, we're, we're playing for the game itself. And uh, I don't know. Like I've there's been some hype, but we haven't really seen any actual action take place. But there's been a video. I know you saw it, Jim. I figure let's go ahead and play it now. If people haven't seen it, let them see it here, and uh, let's get your maybe a little reaction here. When Oscar came in, like our first pitchers meeting in the spring training was just like an analytical uh, seminar for dummies. Like he went over every single word, every number that you see, uh, the reports that you see. He kind of broke down how to read them and how to interpret them, which was really nice for me. Um, it was kind of like a fresh start. Uh, his advanced knowledge of how to use information. Uh, and then the thing that sold me was I talked to some players that I really trusted about him. And they raved about him. And when players players will give you honesty when you when you talk to him, especially if you have relationships with him. And the guys that I talked to were over the top on him. I think our interview went really well, just meshing together. I think uh, from the conversations we had, obviously in our interview, and we had a lot of the same philosophies in the sense of how to make guys better, you know. And, and part of it was maximizing the abilities that someone has. And, and we really messed with when it came to that. With Oscar, the, the biggest thing is, is we're taking that next step as a pitching staff of, you know, starting to use the analytics and uh, numbers to our advantage. Um, not that it wasn't done in the past, but I think um, just the way that we were taught in spring training and the way we applied it to bullpens, live BPs, outings, um, we're starting to utilize it a lot more. I think because of, of getting up to date with everything that's happening, and uh, I think being around their age kind of kind of helps out too. Just understanding what what they're used to, understanding exactly how how their minds work and how they're they're learning these days, and a lot of it comes to. Uh, it being in, in front of a screen, looking at numbers, um, I think being able to translate in them that information and making it easier to to read and see and to understand, uh, I think really helps out. So I don't know, Jim. I'm I'm kind of liking what this guy's saying. You know, like this is the first time we've had any, like real audio, and of course it's the Pirates; they fluff it up a bit. But it's the first time you know we got some real audio from him. The players, you know, re reactions, their interactions, such with him. I don't know, man. Like, what's your take? No, I mean, it's definitely something to be optimistic about because that was one of the things that we heard the past couple years about the previous staff is they really didn't leverage those statistics and analytics and the new technology like Repsoto and, and stuff like that. Um, so knowing that, you know, every throwing session is accompanied by that, um, they're, they're pitching with a purpose. They're, they're being told, Hey, here's, here's what works for you. Here's why you should do it. Let's go ahead and let's do this. Um, that's really refreshing to see because as we've heard from pitchers like Tyler glass, now um, Garrett Cole, you know, pitchers who left this organization and to other organizations that use stuff like this, uh, the pirates were just way behind the rest of the league when it came to this. Absolutely. Uh, so, so seeing that they're now, you know, on par now with, with other teams and, and utilizing this information in a way that will help them on the field is it's refreshing and it's, it's exciting to see. Yeah. Like the thing that stood out for me was the fact that he said, like, I'm here basically to improve upon what these guys do. Like these guys do great already. You know, it seemed like it was one size fits all. Here's the box of race Searage. And here's how we need to get you inside this box. And again, as you know, Ryan and I have stated before on the podcast, and I'm sure you can kind of claim this as well. I mean, this isn't a harp session on the old regime. You know, they did some stuff that was really well. You know, they were very forward thinking in their analytics back in the day, which was, you know, eight years ago now. So long ago, Jim. Jesus. Um, 
But you know, like like we we heard about you know the shifting and the pitch to contact and the ground balls and like it worked. It just seemed as if the Pirates were just so stuck in their ways that you know this is how it's worked before. This is how we do it. So they just continued it, and we've seen how like it, the game just outgrew that. So seeing this guy come in, it's like all right, listen, this is what you do well. Let me make you better, right? This is what you do well. Let me make you better. And it's like you're letting your pitchers be themselves and just getting them better. So I, I do. I, I really I like that. It's good to hear the fact that these you know players are just like kind of taken back. I'm not gonna say they're completely dumbfounded, but they're just like, wow, like these are analytics. Like this is this stuff they've been talking about for five years and we never heard about. You know, right. and Mitch Keller apparently had like a rap soda at his home, like his own house, um, since the spring training and summer camp. So I'm very, like you said, very optimistic. Uh, I'm excited to see what this season will bring for our pitching. Uh, and like uh, you mentioned too as well, like it seems like it starts with Oscar Marine. Yeah, no, same thing. I'm excited. And you know, he even mentioned, you know, what kind of makes it nice is that, uh, you know, our pitching staff's pretty young. So they're, they're really acceptant. You know, they, they, they're, they're willing to learn and they're willing to kind of soak up this new technology. Whereas, you know, if you had a team full of guys who were, you know, in the league for 10 years, maybe it'd be a little bit different, but um, you know, the staff is definitely, it seems like they're willing to listen to them, willing to use the technology, take that information and apply it to their, their throwing sessions and, and their, and their games. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. And it's something that we've been talking about for a while now, right? I mean, we can all we can all see that everybody's hey, talking about for a while. Yeah. Like everybody knew last year, hey, Jordan Lyles needs to throw his breaking ball more, yet he never did. And there's all these studies saying, hey, with Jordan Lyles, he's got this elite pitch that he doesn't ever throw. Why didn't he start throwing it more? Um, you know, same thing with Chris Archer. Mm. You know, he's got this this crazy slider, but he he's not throwing it enough. And then the same thing we saw with Keller last year, you know, that, that curveball of his, it's, it's an elite curveball, and we just saw a bunch of fastballs. So it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see that, that actually is going to be probably the most interesting part of this season is just looking at the difference between pitch usage between last year and this year. I'm actually really excited to see that just to see how big of a difference uh, these philosophies are on the field. So that, that that's something I'm going to be looking at. I got to kind of agree with you there too. I, I think I'm, I'm right with you. Like I, I want to see, you know, some of these younger guys and stuff play, you know, offensively, whatever, um, you know, hopefully see some improvement or consistency out of Josh Bell. Can he do it again? But I'm with you. I think the number one thing for me is seeing the transition from last year to this year with the pitching staff in a whole, right? How the users are pitching, how well they do it. Like you mentioned, I mean, Mitch Keller, this beautiful curveball, like you said, it's a great pitch. Why is he throwing a fastball 60% of the time that got lasered? Now I can't remember the stats, but I talked about all on Tuesday stream, Jim, that you could not hear. But, you know, I think it got hit for like over 400. Like the batting average is like four something on his fastball. Slugged like seven something. And that's the pitch he hit. He used 60% of the time. When meanwhile, the curveball, I think it was like a 133 batting average, like a 200 slugging. So I'm with you. I'm really excited this year to see like the progress and the fundamental change of like this philosophy. Yeah, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have like stat cast pages open all year long just to be like, okay, what what was this like last year? What's it like this year? I, I, it'll be interesting to see the change. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And actually, one thing I want to hit on too is something you mentioned I didn't really think of too, like how you said that they're younger and they're easy to transist, you know, and receive this information. Um, it kind of reminds me a little bit, not to the degree, but maybe that speaks to Oscar himself. You know, that's what you need. Like he's able to let people buy it into what he's trying to show them. And that's a leadership skill. That's something like you don't just have. Most people don't. Like I can think about all the times your parents told you what to do and you're like, shut up, dad. I'm not listening to you, right? But then you go to some stranger and pay him like $100 an hour. And you're like, oh, okay, I'll listen to you. So, <laughs> right? It's like right. That's, that's something that Oscar might have. That's a skill set that he had. Something that, let's be honest, go back. Think about what Clint Hurdle had to do. Tell his guys, no, I know you play shortstop, but you're not standing there. You got to stay way over here, right? And I know you guys can pitch. AJ Brennan, I know you can pitch a lot of strikes, but we need you to pitch a contact. You know, I mean, that was a skill set of Clint Hurdle. He was able to relate. So seeing Oscar have that relatability as well as an actual effective pitching mentality, yes, I'm very intrigued. 
Yeah, and like, like just to kind of piggyback off that, you know, going back to Mike Fitzgerald, when he left the team, what was that, 2016, he went to Arizona. Um, he was like that guy who was the liaison between the front office analytics staff and the players where he would, he would basically be the guy to interpret the analytics to the players in a way that got them to buy in. Right. And it was easy to see that, you know, once, once he, once Mike Fitzgerald left the organization, you know, things went downhill. Um, it was either a communication thing where they weren't able to, to, to get that to the players in a way that they understood or, or believed. Right. Mm -hmm. But like, like you said, um, it seems like the players have bought in. It seems like Oscar has that, that way of talking to him where they're, they're, you know, where they're, they're taking it. And I think a lot of it too, is they didn't have success last year either. So it's a lot easier to buy into something new when <laughs> that, know, the, the old thing didn't work. Right. So when, when the old stuff doesn't work and you're getting trashed by your old teammates about how, you know, that stuff doesn't work. Um, it's probably a little bit easier to accept it as well. But no, at least that's that's going to be one of the biggest things I look at. I look at this year. Same, same. I agree. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's move on. <clears throat> let's go ahead and talk about. We gave uh, our over and unders right. We gave out like five random stats. Uh, predict the over and unders go. But let's go ahead and continue our over and under series. This is going to be on the National League, so we have the teams. We have gotten our over and unders from which I don't even remember. Not that it matters, truly. It's Vegas, so you know it's legit. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't remember. Oh, Odd, like Odd Shark. Odd Shark. Yeah. yeah. One of the Vegas online sites. You know, it's funny. I was trying to look at like rivers and other places, and of course, me being in Florida, I don't, can't actually get onto the true rivers, but I was trying to find some of the local. I couldn't. So, yeah, we're going Odd Shark. I believe that's what we used before in the past sometime, too. Anyway, so we have our over and unders. Um, and also, just so you guys can know, since we're speaking of websites, uh, the week one odds are out there on sportsbettingdime.com. You can go ahead and they have the week one odds. You can guys bet some money on whatever team you want. If you agree with Mike, with, uh, Mike if you agree with Ryan Platt, Go ahead and put it on the Pirates because Musgrove's throwing a no-hitter. Possibly a perfect game. I don't know. But, uh, yes, yeah, so they have their odds. But we'll go ahead and talk about our over and unders. I don't know, Jim. Maybe we'll start with the West. Okay. This, this, this one here, I mean, I think we all can agree. It's probably going to be the Dodgers winning it. But let's, let's start right at the top. And what I'm going to do is I will go ahead and... take ours for those want a little peek behind the scene you know we talk jim you can attest to this you know we, we talk behind the scenes about ryan being a boomer here and there we've said it on the show a bunch of times too if anyone wants to know to this day every time we've done one of these and ryan had to take information he's used a pen and a pad every single time every time this guy Don't always even. still uses a pen you know i do and i think like a yellow it's i think it's yellow even his paper so I'm not using that, but I, I do have one handy. You can, you can tell the old school journalist in him is, is coming out, apparently. Yes. But I'm going to do this on my MacBook, on a computer. We're in 2020 now. So let's start with the Dodgers. The over and under gem is 37 and a half games. You think we'd be talking about the, uh, the Orioles last year, but this is the 2020 Dodgers. 37 and a half games. This is the whole thing's um, weird. But 37 and a half, 37 and a half games is a lot. Um, I mean, that means you'd go 38 and 22. That's, that's a really good stretch. I mean, the Dodgers are certainly capable of doing that. Um, let's see last year, they had a 654 win percentage. So if you take a 654 win percentage over 60 games, that's 39 wins. Um, whew. And they didn't really get worse. You could argue they got I better. Mean, they, yeah, right. They they only <laughs> added Mookie Betts. Yeah, they only And they're added getting Mookie Gavin Lux to come up from their minor leagues that everyone yeah. wants. Yeah, they only added the second best player in the American <laughs> League. Um, right. 
You know what, though? I'm actually going to – here's the thing, though. I do think the rest of the division is going to be a little bit better. So, like, the Padres, for example, mm-hmm. are going to be better this year than they were last year. Um, and then also they they will have to face the Astros, the Angels, right. the A's. Yep. So I don't think that winning percentage will stick. So 37 and a half, I'm going to go ahead and say they, they finish with like 36 wins. I All still right. think they win the division and they win it handily, but I'm going to go under 37 and a half. Okay. And I like all that, all that that you just said. I mean, the, the one thing that's going to be different this year is percentage wise, there's a lot more interleague games. You know, it's a 40 20 split. So they are going to play a lot of AL West teams. And that AL West isn't a cakewalk, you know? So not only, like you mentioned, they're, the Diamondbacks are better. The Potters are better. You know, the Giants are what they are. It's not like they, they're worse than they were the last year. Same with the Rockies. Uh, maybe Rockies a little bit, but who knows. But anyways, it's like, yeah, most teams you think have gotten better. So it only calculates the Dodgers get worse. And my mindset is you're going to see maybe a pattern in this here. But my mindset, as I talked about last week on our show, is I am a firm believer, Jim. You said we're going to find out if it's true or not this year, but I'm a firm believer that the pitching is going to be head of hitting. And the teams that have the better pitching, you know, stand out. Not that I think the Dodgers pitching is bad by any means, but it's good. It's, it's not like it's Garrett Cole, Justin Verlander, and, you know, Zach Grinke from before good. But uh, yeah, I'm kind of right there with you too. Like, I'm going to take the under. Like, I would be shocked like, if they win 37. Like, I feel like that's what it's going to be. It's going to be 37. I'll play the odds, take the under, and it's going to be like a 37 wins, and we're both good. They easily win the division, and we win some money. Boom. There you go. All right. Next up, the Diamondbacks. I'm sorry. No. Next up, the, the Padres at 31 wins, so also over 500. Yeah. Um, so the Padres are a team that I think over the course of an entire season, I would have pick them as like a dark horse wild card candidate um mainly because they've got a lot of pitchers like right on the door mm. who i think could help them um i don't think like mackenzie gore starts this year with them he you know potentially could come up later um i i think the 31 wins 60 game season I'm going to go with under another under. If I, I'm going to say that they win 30 games. Like I think they're, th- they're a 500 team. Okay. I, uh, I like what you've said as well. They, they definitely are young. They're up and coming. There's a couple guys that I feel like have that potential of really breaking out. You know, they have Machado who was, I mean, this guy was a stud. Um, He's yeah. still good. I feel like Machado is like forgotten about these days. Like, you know, who talks about Manny Machado anymore? Not really too many people. He's still there. Right. So, and he's still so young, too. I know. Isn't that crazy? Like Mookie Betts, even too. Like, you're talking about Mookie Betts and guys 27 years old. <laughs> right. So, uh, I don't know, man. This one, that 31 is such a good number to me because, like, it's just barely over 500. And I look at this team. I mean, one or two games, that's how, like, this whole entire year for every one of these, one or two games swings so much. And that's why this year's going to be so weird. I, myself, I'm going to go ahead and take the over on the Padres. I'm kind of buying into them a little bit this year. Uh, I'm going to take the over. And, again, I'll be happy if it's 32 games. We're we're good there. So, yeah, I take the over. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't know why on this screen here I have the Diamondbacks all the way to the bottom, but they're also at 31 <laughs> games, uh, Jim. So next up, we will go with yeah. the Diamondbacks. Ooh, so I think the 31 number is like pretty, pretty perfect. Um, I am going to go ahead and say, I guess there's no such thing as a push here. So we're gonna, I'm going to go ahead and say the Diamondbacks are over 31. Um I don't know. Have we heard like is it what's going on with Starling Marte? Is he playing? Is he reported to camp? Yes, Do actually he that? he was uh, okay. He was actually playing, I believe, yesterday as well. He okay. hit so I, a double, I think. So I'm going to say over. I think they win 32 games. I like that. 
Um, you know what? There's a lot to like about the Diamondbacks as well. But it's like, speaking of Marte, is Cattell Marte going to do the same thing? Is Christian Walker going to do the same thing? There's some skepticism. There's a lot of talk about Robbie Ray in camp. Uh, maybe another guy that's buying into analytics and, and changing his throwing motion and everything. So I do like the Diamondbacks as well. You ever just have this gut feeling, though, like that's going to be a team that doesn't live up to it? Like something's going to happen? I do like the Diamondbacks, and that's why I took the over on the Padres as well, because I look at them almost like right there beside each other. My gut's talking to me on the Diamondbacks mm-hmm. to say, take the under, and that's just what I'm going to do. There's no reason okay. behind it. <laughs> it's just one team's <laughs> got to win 31, one thing's got to go, one, you know, 32, I guess, if whatever you say. Uh, I'm going to take the under on those. Fangraphs, by the way, projects both the Padres and the Diamondbacks to win 31 games. <laughs> there you go. And that's, like I said, I mean, I look at them, they're very, yeah. to me, they're very, I mean, they're right there. They're like almost the same team, just differently. Um, yep. About as talented. So, yeah, whatever. Um, next up is the Colorado Rockies, which also is out of order. At least we have a stream that's going well, Jim. So the Colorado Rockies are next up, 27 and a half wins. Jim, they got Trevor Story and Nolan Arado, 27 and a half wins. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm assuming that may have to do with – I mean, they they underperformed big time last year. They're, they, they, they were bad. Um, 20, was it 27 and a half. I think they go over that. I think they're like a 28, 29-win team. So I'm going to go over I think, I mean, the offense is good. The pitching definitely didn't live up to expectations last year. Like they had some guys who, you know, had some pretty high expectations and they didn't perform. So right. I'm going to go, I'm going to go over on, the, on that. Well, they got Trevor Story. They got Nolan Arenado, right? Like you said, they have a very decent offense. Charlie Blackman out there. You know what they don't have, Jim? They don't have Ian Desmond. And Ian Desmond cost them runs, right? Ian Desmond cost them wins. So now without having Ian Desmond, I agree with you on this one as well. I am going to take the over, albeit it's not going to be much. I feel like there's still be a below 500 team, but maybe, hey, it's 29 wins, right? 28. They're at 27 and a half. I'll go ahead and take the over, just barely, but I'm with you. I think the loss of Ian Desmond has earned them my over. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> and and so next up uh, and last we have the Giants, the San Francisco Giants at twenty five and a half wins. Yeah. So so my, the Giants are my pick to be the worst team in the league. Um. Twenty five and a half. I think they'll be just under that. I could see them maybe doing like a twenty four. You know, 24 and 36. Um, no Buster Posey. He's sitting out. They lost Bumgarner. Um, I just don't see where they they improved from last year. And last year they were bad. So I, I think they will take a step back before they, you know, start taking steps forward. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say under for the Giants. Yeah. You want to talk about a team, Jim, that's just old. <laughs> You know, there's a difference between veteran presence and just old. And this team is old. You know, like Johnny Cueto's coming back, and I get that. And he's going to be the opening day starter, and he's supposedly help, healthy. And this layover has helped him out, you know, recover and stuff. But, like, you're talking about Johnny Cueto, who isn't young, coming off a of Tommy John surgery. You know, th- this team isn't young. And your best, like, the face of the franchise you mentioned, he's opting out. <laughs> that was like your hope of like having any relevancy, right? Any any airtime, any highlight clips, Buster Posey, gone. So I'm with you. Like I feel the Giants are definitely going to be that team that everyone beats up on. Um, and I just look at this way too. I don't know. Maybe it's whatever. But it's a 60 games like season. Everything's weird. Are these old guys, right? These veteran players, are they really even into it? Like they just want to get this thing over with and look forward to next year. This con- next contract, I don't know. I just feel like like you, like the Giants is going to be the team yeah. that everyone beats up on, and they go home, call it a season. Let's see, twenty twenty one. 
Yeah, and I mean, I'm looking at like their their individual preseason projections on here, and the the leading offensive player on their team, according to you know WAR Fangraphs WAR, is Brandon Belt and Brandon Crawford tied at 0.6 WAR for the year. <laughs> so like that's say, not a, that's, that's not that's good. A, not a good recipe for success there. Um, and then Kevin Gosman is projected to be their best pitcher at 0.9 WAR. So they're not, they don't have a single player on their team projected for a win above replacement. There you go. And and there's 25 players, Jim. So if everyone had a win, that's 20. <laughs> <laughs> that's not how it works. I'm joking, but you know what I'm getting at. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. yeah, that just yeah, that's that's not good, man. This, the Giants team is just awful, and the Buster Posey news just made it worse. And what, I, they could be the team that has 19 wins. Honestly, they, they could be the 15 and 45 team that Mark Maddo was referencing. I could see <laughs> but that. What about? But what about what does this do to Buster Posey's legacy? Oh my God! What a <laughs> trash comment! <laughs> oh God! I, I'll give him this. At yeah. least he owned it, deleted it. He did. Did he delete it? He did. He he did. Okay. You know, I don't remember exactly what it was. I think he took the stance of like, well, it was just a question I was putting out there for other people. Like I didn't firmly believe that. I was just putting out there to like gain the information or whatever. I didn't think it was going to blow up the way it did. I'll, I'll say like at least he owned it. And he took it down. He didn't like keep running with it. I'm like, no, no, no. This is what I believe in. Anyways. Um, all right. So, Jim, we did the NL West. Let's move a little bit closer. Some debate the Pirates should be in this because Pittsburgh's a East Coast team like myself. But let's go with the NL East. Uh, topping this chart, which I, I did correctly, topping this chart is uh, it's a tie, but we'll start with Atlanta. The Atlanta Braves are at 30 four games um so i think the braves are the number two team in the national league behind the dodgers um i love ronald lacuna i love ozzy albies hopefully freddie freeman is is ready for opening day like he's 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 another exciting player to watch sure um i think I mean, I think Ozzy Albies is one of the most underrated players in all of baseball. Um, they, they've got Marcelo Zuna this year. They've got a solid one-two with Soroka and Max Freed, Fried, Freed. I don't know. I, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> and then they brought in Cole Hamels, too. Like, I, I, think, the, I think the staff is good enough to, to play in the postseason, but if we're talking – Talking regular season here, the NL East is a pretty good division, mm. um, and so is the AL East, also a good division. So, thirty-four seems high. I think I could see them coming in at like thirty-three, and tw- I'm going to take the under on this because I think they'll be like a thirty-two or thirty-three win team. I think that wins the NL East, though. So I think they win the NL East, but I'm going to take the under. Okay. That's fair. That everything you said, I can agree with. I mean, we've been talking about the Braves for how how many years it seems like this dynasty. It's about to present itself. Right? All these prospects they had, the international signings they had. One of them being Acuna, who's a superstar, <clears throat> not as good as Juan Soto, but anyways, a superstar. Uh, but yeah, like all that's true. They also added your boy, our boy, Yasiel Puig, fan of all Pirate fans. <laughs> So, true. <laughs> so now they have Puig in there as well. I'm with you. Like the thing about, I think the NL East, well, really both Easts are. This is the toughest division in baseball by far. You know, because look at this division. You have the Nationals. You got the Mets. You got the Phillies. You got the Braves. But there's only one team in that division that looks not so good. Who's also improved as the Marlins. You know, went in the West. And you talk about the Rockies and the and the Giants. You know, there, there's two teams that, you know, are well under, under. And then the Padres and Diamondbacks, as we mentioned, are about the good talent-wise. They're about 500 teams. But we look at this East. Like, that East division NL is good. Well, guess what, Jim? Guess what, everyone else? They got to play the Yankees. They got to play the Red Sox, the Blue Jays, right? The Rays. Yeah, they get the Orioles. But, like, there's really only two teams in that 
division that whatever, right. You want to call it that are like cakewalks. Yeah. That's it. Every game is a harder game. And in 60 games, we talk about anything can happen. Anything can literally happen. And I just feel like so many teams in this division, right. In both divisions are just going to beat up on each other. And like how you mentioned, they could easily win the division with 33 wins because it could be 33 and 33, right. Someone with 32, and the other wild card's 32 or something, you know? So, like, it's going to be so mm-hmm. tight in here. I'm with you. So, I – it's just so – it's so hard to do these ones. Six games, it's so tough to do this. I'm going to take the under on the Braves as, as well. Um, I'm also saying that they're not winning the division. That will come. Okay. All right. So next up, we have also tied with 34 wins, the Washington Nationals. Well, if I if I said the Braves are under and they're going to win the division, <laughs> I guess that <laughs> means I'm under. I guess that means I'm under with the Nationals. Um, the Nationals' strength is obviously their pitching. Um, they've got probably probably the best one, two, three. You know the, that you can think of out there. Um, you know, just Scherzer and Strasburg alone are, are going to pick up some wins. Um, and yeah, Juan Soto's a stud. Trey Turner's going to be healthy the entire year. So that's another, another positive for them, um, which is a, you know, a reason why they started off so slow last year was he, he was hurt. Um, right. But I think they also slayed into that same 32, 33 win spot. So I'm going to go under. All right. Here is where I present to you who I think will win the division. I think it will be the Nationals, right? The reigning World Series champions. Uh, Acuna, just not as good as Juan Soto. And in the standings, it will show also. But as I mentioned earlier about the pitching being ahead of the batting, you just nail it right there. That one, two, three is disgusting, right? You got Scherzer, Strasburg, Corbin. That's just nasty. <laughs> and when you look at the Braves, yeah, Sirocco, Freed, like they're good, but I feel like they're nowhere there. Like the, the Braves are really going to have to rely on their bats as well. The Nationals have the bats, but their pitching can win a game, especially out early. And that's why I do believe the Nationals win it. I'm going to take the over. I feel, again, like they could have 35 and the Braves have 34, even though what I mentioned earlier was, you know, the opposite of what I'm saying right now. But, I mean, that could happen. But I do believe I'm going to take the over, and that's why. Their pitching just by far to me is the best in that division, and that's why they win it with the over. Next, I, I, think, I think it could definitely happen. I, I, so. There you go. And they have Daniel Hudson. So That's all you need. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Next up, we have the New York Mets. 32 wins, Jim. Um, well, I said under for the Braves, under for the Nationals. I guess I'm going to go – gosh, I, I can't take all these unders, but I, I got to go under with the Mets too because I think the Braves and the Nationals are 32, 33 win teams. Um, Mets have DeGrom who – who knows what he can do in a small, in a short season. He could, he could put up an ERA under one, you know, who knows what's going to happen there. <laughs> True. Um, you go old so, school Roger Clemens on us. Yeah. He's, he, he's, he's just going to, he's a stud. Um, but I think, this, I think that all goes back to having to play 20 games against the AL East. So like that, that's also going to play a part in keeping these teams win totals down. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I mean, I could see the Mets, Mets are going to be 31, 32 wins. So I'm, I don't think they go over that. So I guess I'm saying under. That's fair. This, this is the team that Jim, they've tricked me every year. Every year the Mets trick me. Well, you know what? As George Bush said, fool me once, don't fool me again. So they're not going to fool me this year, Jim. I'm taking the under on the Mets. You know, there was a big blow when they lost. Sondergrad, as Ryan says, Cindergard. Uh, they lost Sondergrad, so big blow to them there. Yeah, I mean, DeGrom, he's a fantastic pitcher, but that's one guy. And it seems like there's always injuries with them. You know, I know the polar bear is a monster out there in first base, 
but I just, yeah, you're not going to fool me again. So I'm going to take the under as well, especially in that tough, tough division, uh, as we've mentioned. So there it is. So there's my under. So we will go ahead. Next up is the Philadelphia Phillies, 31 and a half. There's not much separating these teams, Jim. No, no, there's not. In, in a short season, like it's all, it's all crammed together. Um, 31 and a half Phillies. So, uh, I mean, eventually I've got to go with, with an over here. I'm going to say the Phillies squeak by it, 32 wins. Um, I think, I mean, I think they're a good team. Um, they're, they still obviously need some help on the pitching side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, Aaron Nola is good. Zach Wheeler definitely helps. Arietta, you know, needs to, if he comes back to being somewhat of his old self, I think that, you know, that helps a lot, but, uh, offensively they're solid. I mean, JT Real Muto is probably the best catcher in baseball. Um, you know, Harper is, is awesome. Um, Hoskins had a down year, so it's going to see, you're going to have to see what he does. I actually am looking at Andrew McCutcheon as having a really big year for them as well. Like a nice bounce back season. He was off to a good start last year before tearing his ACL. So I think he helps out the offense a lot too. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll go eventually I got to go with an over. So I'm going to go over <laughs> on this one. There you go. Uh, you know what, Jim, what you said about Andrew McCutcheon, he was drafted by me last night in the NS9 fantasy draft. And I'm with you. Like, good, if you understand, pick. like, Andrew McCutcheon for what he is right now, I mean, he's still a good player. Like, I don't want to poo-poo Andrew McCutcheon and say he's terrible because he's not the greatest baseball player that ever played in the 2000s in Pittsburgh, right? So he's still a good player. You know, like, the guy gets on base still at a ridiculous rate. And we saw when he went to New York even before the actual injury in Philly. Like, he, you know, the Giants wasn't terrible. You know, because in New York, he was still very solid. He goes to Philadelphia solid. So I'm, I'm with you. Like, I feel he's going to be very, very solid. We know he's having fun. This guy's living his best life right now. So, oh, yeah. uh, but I just look at this, the pitching staff. Like, yes, Aaron Nola, definitely very good. Zach Wheeler. I am, if I have an over and under of one game pitch this year for Zach Wheeler, I'm taking the under. I'm a firm believer in Zach Wheeler. I think for some reason or another, you being in the TFL league, when we talk about this, this league, Ryan, and I talk about, you also are in it now. So you can relate. Yeah. I went ahead and signed Zach Wheeler to a nice deal because I believe in his talents and what he might be able to do in Philly. But he's got a baby due in a couple weeks. Sounds like he's not going to pitch at least until the baby's you know born and then determine if he's going to continue to pitch. I'm taking the under of one game pitch this year for Zach Wheeler, which I think is a big blow because, again, we're talking about the guy who believes in the pitchers, right? So we also know that Bryce Harper is basically – Stalin Marte wrapped up in a Bryce Harper doll, right? I, I think he's good too, but he's good. He's good. There, there's possibly Adam Hazley going to be in center mm. field. Uh, Scott mm. Kingery, I, I like, but he hasn't proven it yet. Like, there's still a lot of holes in this team. So at 31 and a half wins, Jim, I'm going to take the under on the Phillies. They're not a bad team. Okay. And again, I think the biggest blow is when you lose a Zach Willer, who you have the potential of. You know, this potential ace coming up, right? Like, that's why you pay him this big money. You don't pay a guy $100 million because he's uh, he's okay. So that's going to be a big blow losing him. That equates to why I'm going on the under. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to take the under on the Phillies also. Yeah, so if Wheeler doesn't pitch, I'll go under as well. But for now, I, I think he I think he pitches. Oh, I see. So I'll take you over. So we just hedge our bets now, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just bet both. <laughs> Perfect. You can't lose then, right? Ten dollars right. on each. That's how you. That's how you tear down Vegas. All right. So last up, we have the Miami Marlins at twenty-four and a half wins. Jim, I believe what was it? The the Giants at twenty-five and a half. Do I gotta go back? Yeah, that was right. Yeah, the um, Giants at twenty-five and a half. So they have the Marlins at twenty-four and a half. So one game less than we just, you know, pooped on the, the Giants. Yeah. One game worse. What's your take? So I think the Marlins are better than they were last year. Um, and I already said the Giants are going to be the worst team in the National League. 
So I don't think the Marlins will be that bad. I actually really like Jorge Alfaro. Um, mm. I like Isan Diaz. Um, mm. You know, so that there's some guys on that team who I like Corey Dickerson. Um, you know, going just kind of going through their lineup here. Uh, you know, that's a nice addition. Their pitching still obviously needs a little bit of work, um, but there's they're they're young, right? And so they 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 really can do anything. You don't really know. Um, so I'm gonna say over. I think the Marlins are at least eight twenty five win team. So I'm gonna go over. Okay. You forgot you said Dickerson, but let's not forget they also have our boy Francisco Cervelli. They do. So they do. I, mean, but I said on. I liked Alfaro. I like Alfaro a lot. I do too. Alfaro also a fantasy player for my team. Okay. Um yeah, in the Romuto trade, the best pitcher or best catcher in baseball. You know what, Jim? I I kind of had this soft spot for the Marlins. Uh with me moving to Jacksonville, they've kind of become like my second team, if you may. Uh, I follow them because I'm a glutton for punishment. You know, I didn't choose being down here, the Rays, by all means. No, I chose the Marlins. <laughs> so, so you know, watching them from afar, and then, of course, in our Strat League, I have the Marlins. You know, I have a little close eye on them. So they've kind of been like mm-hmm. my little, I don't know, teddy bear of a team. I, I really do like, I like what they're doing. I think they've, Jeter coming in, they've made a lot of really good moves. I think this is a much better team than it was last year. I just feel like I want so much in my heart to go in the over because I I feel for this team. You know, I I think they're doing better on the right track. But, man, Jim, these teams are freaking ridiculous. Can you imagine being the Marlins, right? And you're you're on the cusp, like you're getting better. But every day you got to face the Nationals, the Braves, the Phillies, the Red Sox, the Yankees, the Blue Jays. Come on, like can we get a break here? You know, when you are the worst team and everyone's so much better than you, it doesn't matter how much you've improved. There's no one else out there to to beat up against. You know, you don't have the Tigers and the the Royals canceling each other out here and there, getting some wins. So I do believe in the team getting better, but I'm going to take the under just because this division is so good, Jim. I can I can respect that. <laughs> I can I can agree with that. I'm yeah. going to take over, but I could see that argument as well. I like it, and that's why I had like preferences because I don't, you know, I gotta have some respect for yeah. the Marlins. But man, it's gotta be tough being a Marlins fan this year. Okay, so I like it. So just kind of recap. So on the West, you took three overs, two unders. In the East, you took two overs, three unders. So good track. I myself right. in the West so far have taken three unders, two overs, and then oh boy. In the East, I took one over, and the rest were all unders. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now let's let's bring it home, Jim. We're moving from the East. We're going to the NL Central. Number one tops the list: the St. Louis Cardinals, thirty-two and a half wins. Jim, what are we doing with the Cardinals? The NL Central's. <laughs> It's similar. It's gonna, they're they're going to end up similar to the NL East in that there's a bunch of teams that are going to be in that 30 to 33 win standpoint. It's going to be for an entirely different reason, <laughs> you know. So the NL East, you've got all these teams who are like really good and they're going to beat up on each other. Right. I think in the NL Central, you just have a bunch of teams that are like okay. The, uh-huh. You know, they're good, but they're just going to rack up wins against each other. Um, they're not necessarily going to beat on each other. Um, the Cardinals. Oh God, I hate the Cardinals. Thirty-two and a half is the over/under there. Yep. I um. I Sorry, don't I love the. I, I don't love the Cardinals. I don't love the Cardinals pitching staff. Like at, outside Jack Flaherty, who is is great. I think the rest of them are not good adam wainwright's like 50 years old Mm -hmm. dakota hudson hasn't been able to pitch since he you know since we couldn't touch him in the playoffs um miles mikolas is just i have no idea how he did anything last year but i don't foresee him continuing that um so i i I don't think the cardinals win the division so i'm gonna Mm. go i'm gonna go under i think they're gonna win about 31 
31 games. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're taking the under. I'm taking the under. Which, again, it's so crazy because, like, it's at 32 and a half, and you're saying 31. Like, right. it's, it's crazy. <laughs> you know, you, you take the under on 87 and say 83, and it's a four-game swap. But now, like, we're talking about, like, one game. Like, that one game is huge difference. Two games. Oh, my God. There are three games worse. That's, it's crazy this year. So the Cardinals, <laughs> 32 and a half wins. Like, I'm with you. And, and man, this, this NL Central, like, that's the division you want to be in, which is why we've, I think, kind of talked about, like, anything can happen in baseball with 60 games. But, like, if you're in NL Central, anything can happen. So it bodes well if you are a Pirates fan. Not to say this team is a playoff team by any means, but, like, this is the division you want to be in if you're the Pirates to have a prayer. There's, there's no good pitching. Like, the Cardinals aren't that good, but, like, where's the Pirates? Where's really the Reds, the Brewers, the Cubs? You know, I don't look at any pitching in this division and say, okay, that's stacked. That's why I'm going to take the over in this team because pitching is going to be ahead than batters, right, which I've been saying. So I don't know, man. Like, who is going to win 33 games in this division? Someone's got to, right? Is it going to be the Cardinals? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I just – I'm with you. I'm going to take the under as well. Just as this overall team, I don't think they're, they're really that complete. The pitching – they're leaving the hitting defense. Yadier Molina also is 50 years old. Let's not forget about him. Uh, so I, I, I'm with you. I'm going to take the under, but I'm not I'm not sold on anything I say in this division, just to put that out there. Yeah, like, I mean, this division, literally anything can happen. So there it is. Yeah. All right. Well, if it ain't, if it ain't the Cardinals, Jim, is it this next team? So the Cubs... They're sitting at 32 wins for their over and under. Um, I really don't like the Cubs pitching staff. You know, outside outside Darvish, Hendricks is okay. Um, Lester is just old now. And Lester can't hit anymore. That's I feel like that's how he beat the Pirates all the time, is he would hit he would kill us with like a Game winning double in the seventh inning of a one one game. Well, technically um, he can hit. So I don't know. They might let him okay. they might let him bat I, if he's playing the Pirates. That's true. <laughs> they might um, give him the Billy Hamilton role. You know, well, you're playing the Pirates, so here you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the DH definitely helps out a team like the Cubs more than pretty much any other team in the in the central. Um, you know, it basically it's a perfect spot for someone like Kyle Schwarber you know, to get a bunch of at bats because you really don't want him in the field anywhere. Right. Um, so I, I, I think that helps them out. Um, 32 though. I'm sticking under Ooh. on 32 wins though. I still don't think the Cubs are even the division winner. Ooh, Ooh, Ooh. A lot of power fans are loving this, Jim. You're speaking to them, hating yeah. on the Cubs, hating on the Cardinals. They love you. <laughs> <laughs> so i mean i've said it the pitching sucks pretty much everywhere but i don't know you darvish apparently has added a 11th pitch jim <laughs> he's worked on something else this year uh can never have too many pitches apparently if you're a starting pitcher so i don't know man like i do agree with you i think the dh does benefit them because just like as you mentioned kyle schwarber they've been trying to find a position to him i think since he'd come up and it wasn't catcher they, they could remove that so it's been every other position, and none of them has worked out. So him being in the DH, his bat plays, um, they have, like, I feel like a lot of, like, and it might not just be because naturally, but Joe Madden, the way he worked them, like, they have a lot of guys that can play a lot of different positions. So, you know, that could work to their benefit, right, giving people days off, utilizing that DH stuff. So I'm kind of with you there as well. I think that helps them. I am going to take the over. Like, I feel the Cubs are going to be the team that wins the division this year. Just, just for that fact, um, and, and like I said, like everything sucks. I, well, you know, we'll get into it. We got the the Brewers and Reds coming up. We'll, we'll talk about that later. So I will take the yeah. over on the Cubs, but just by one game. <laughs> so, right. what's up? I said okay. You have right. taken over. All right. All right. So next up is the Cincinnati Reds. They are at thirty-one and a half games, Jim. All right, so the Cincinnati Reds are your 2020 NL Central champs. 
Um, that is my prediction, and I'll tell you why. Their pitching staff is by far the best in the division. You know, we mentioned before that there's really not that great of pitching in here. The Reds, however, their top three of Trevor Bauer, Luis Castillo, Sonny Gray is, is clearly the best three in the division. Um, I mean, I think Luis Castillo is a stud. Sonny Gray found, finally found himself again after leaving New York. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I look, I look at Bauer as somebody who's going to bounce back as well. Just somebody with that work ethic, you know, he's always trying to get better. I, I feel like, you know, he's due for a bounce back year. So I think that pitching staff, um, and then they've got Iglesias in the bullpen, who's a you know, kind of a shutdown guy. Um, I, I like the Reds pitching a lot. Um, and then coupling that with their offense, where you have someone who no one really talks about is Eugenio Suarez. The dude hit, I mean, did he hit 50 home runs last year? He, it was 49 or 50 home runs last year. Like he went off. Right. The, the um, Josh they, Ruga lookalike. Yeah. And they, I mean, they added Mike Moustakis. Um, you know, obviously there's still Votto there. Um, the guy that I'm looking to really pick up, um, you know, some, some plate appearances and to perform well is Nick Senzel. Mm. Uh, I love that kid. I feel like last year he didn't really have a position. The Reds bounced him around. He never really settled into a role. I think they'll finally, they, they need to utilize him correctly. And I think he's somebody who's poised to, have a big year Um, because I mean he was top five prospect in baseball going into last year yeah and he really just didn't get used all that often Um, so he's a guy who I think will be a big part of this team and will be a big reason as to why they win the central I could see them 33 wins you know getting it done okay that's uh it, it, I mean, it's not like Pirates fans want to hear anything about the Reds, though, either. You know, you've, you've hated on the Cubs, you've hated on the Cardinals, you're on a good streak, and now you're talking about the Reds. So I think you've, you've I now know. lost some followers. Uh, but I, I can't disagree with everything that you just said. You know, you want to put it on paper, everything that you said, it's, it's true. You know, I, Senzel was a top five prospect and wasn't in center fielder, but last year it was. And, uh, you know, what, what kills me too, and I didn't even realize this until you mentioned it a while back, not that I was looking too closely at the time, but the DH now is universal. There's a DH in the NL, Jim. There's a guy who came up, set a record for the most home runs in like the smallest amount of games, right? Aquino wasn't even on the roster. How do you have a DH spot and not have Aquino up there? I don't know. I have no idea why. If he was there, maybe I would take the over. I am going to take the under, and part of it is just for the fact that kind of gut feeling again, right? It's kind of like with the, I did with, uh, I believe, the Diamondbacks. This team on paper, much like they were last year, like they're the, not going to say the chosen one, but like a lot of teams like them. They were going to be a team that could give teams problems. Not that they're probably going to a playoff team, but they've gotten better. And I feel like this year, too, they're getting a lot of hype, but I think a lot of it's going to be hype. I think when they play the games, just I don't know, the makeup of the team just it still seems very odd to me. Like I get Mustakas, he's at second base. I, I don't know, man. I, I just feel like deep down part of me, they're not going to put it together in the 60 games and 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 do it. They'll be good, they'll be better, they'll be better than the Pirates. The Pirates will be the worst team in this division. But uh just again, just this gut feeling about me. If I'm gonna put my money on it, I'm gonna take the under on the 31 and a half. But again, they could win 30, 31. They're still a buff 500 team, still a good season for them. Uh, but I do think a lot does wait on Trevor Bauer as well. He, this is a guy that really has always intrigued me. You know, I love his mentality, like his worth ethic. Like I love what he, he wants to find information and get himself better. And he's open to anything and everything. He's not your typical, you know, guy from 1950. Like this is the way I've pitched. This is how it's done, whatever. You know, he, he's like in the forefront of all his analytics. He, he wants to learn. But, like, I just, like, could you imagine if that mentality was, I mean, actually, we can say it. Like, imagine giving that mentality to a Justin Verlander. Well, we saw it when he went to Houston. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I just wish Trevor Bauer was also a better pitcher. Uh, something that tells me, like, it just kind of is what he is. He is a number three. And I'm with you. I still believe it is the best staff, but 
I'm going to take the under on Cincinnati. Not that they're a bad team, but I just feel that the Cubs will persevere and be better. All right. All right. So then we'll move on. The next team, also above 500, there's a pattern, the Milwaukee Brewers at 31. Um, Christian Yelich is just a monster. So he, I mean, he's obviously going to help this team out a lot. Um, the pitching staff, again, not great, but having somebody like Josh Hader in the bullpen is going to be huge. I think for this short section of games where say, if they do have a starting pitcher and he starts to falter, you know, around the fifth inning, you can bring in Hader for an inning or two and kind of shut that door. Um, so I, I, I think, I think Josh having Josh Hader is going to be a game changer for them. Um, so he's going to help make up for that lack of starting pitching depth that they have. Brandon Woodruff. I like really don't like anybody else on that staff though. Um, Keston Hira at second base, also another young guy. I like a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, similar to the reds with Senzel, the Brewers acquired somebody this offseason who, again, was a top prospect, didn't really get off to a great start last year, got sent to the minors, and uh, so he was traded over to Milwaukee over the offseason, and I think he is poised to help this team out a lot. And I'm talking about Luis Urias. Yes. Luis Urias. I like him a lot. I think he's going to get – you know, he'll be the everyday shortstop, um, kind of supplanting Orlando Arcia, who is garbage. And uh, I think I think uh, he could have a, a nice, nice year and kind of bring himself back to where he was as a top prospect. He's still super young, um, was kind of pushed out by Tatis Jr. at San Diego. So um, I'm going to say the Brewers finish in second place and they are over. 31 wins. Okay. Okay. I like that. You know, I'll, I'll cut to the chase on this. I also will take the over. Um, this is like, this kind of bucks my trend because I'm with you too. I don't feel the starting pitching is really there for this team, but this is a team that really appeals to me offensively. And like you said too, with Hater, the, the one thing you can do to make up with a lack of starting pitching, especially in a 60 game season, Right, is have a guy like Josh Hader, and they use it. They don't use him like your typical closer. You know, it's not like, well, it's the ninth inning, so let's put this guy out there for you know winning. Like they use him really correctly. <laughs> like many of us have been trying to get people in Pittsburgh to be utilized as right. So you know, I feel he could definitely be a weapon this year. And wasn't it him who said like he wants to pitch over thirty innings? There were or thirty innings, thirty games. There was a pitcher out there who said like they want to pitch basically more than 50% of the games. I forget who it was. I feel like it was him. Yeah, don't know if it was him or not. But, I mean, he, he's certainly capable of doing it, I think. So, well, I think that too. Like, if you're a manager, right, you're not playing the long game. You're playing 60 games. I think you can start using these guys a little more than you normally would in a regular season. So, I think you can make up for that. And then you're absolutely right with the offense they have there, defensively and everything. Uh, I, I'm going to take the over. Not much, but I feel like this team can be the second best team in this division this year. Okay, so you took who? Who did you take the over? So St. Louis, you took over. No, no, I took the under on St. Louis. Okay, so you took under on we, St. Louis. You took over on the Cubs. Yep, I got over on the Cubs, under over on, on, on the Brewers, okay. under right. under on Reds and Cardinals. Okay, with this trash ash division so next up (laughs) save the best for last jim the absolute best the pittsburgh pirates right up there with the giants at 25 and a half games what are you taking on this um 25 and a half just seems really low i mean so i i think i think the pirates were the worst team in in this division um, I don't think they will win it. I mean, <laughs> clearly, uh, they, I mean, they, they obviously they have a chance at 60 games, but, um, 
I, I think the Pirates. I like. I like Musgrove. I like Keller. Um, I think the back end of the bullpen is is fine. You know, good enough. Um, I do like the fact that Polanco is hopefully going to be around. We, we haven't heard about him in the last two days. So hopefully Polanco's here for the whole season and having a DH will help Polanco get some plate appearances and hopefully keep him healthy. Right. I, I like Reynolds. Obviously I like bell. Um, so I, I don't think this team's awful by any means. Like if we look at last year's record. They, they 69 games. So if we take that same pace over an entire season, they're right at, you know, at over a 60 game season, they're right at 25 and a half wins. Right. But we also had a stretch of baseball last year where, you know, players were fighting coaches, players were fighting players, players were <laughs> doing other legal things, things that we won't mention. So, <laughs> it's, it's, there was a, and then on the field, they were just flat out terrible. Um, they're, they, they're not that bad though. So I, I don't think, they're a 25 and a half win team over a 60 game season. I think they're more like a 27 win team. So I'm going to take the over. And and if I had to like make a preseason prediction, I think the pirates go 27 and 33. Okay. That's fair. Um, Yeah, man. Like I, what you said about the Cubs benefiting from the DH, I feel like the pirates really benefit as well, you know, because they, they don't have a great defensive team. You know, they got guys get injured as well. You know, as you mentioned, Polanco, Bell, Moran. Like, it'd be very nice to have those guys in a DH role, right? So that that helps them as well. Um, oddly enough, as I said, like losing Ian Desmond helped the Rockies. You would think that would be the case for like a Chris Archer, but let's go back to what we said about Oscar Moran. I was very intrigued about Chris Archer this year with Moran. I felt. You know, I was I was preaching to the choir all of last year. There's more in the tank for Chris Archer. You know, there's still a good pitcher in there somewhere. Somebody find it. And then Marine comes in, and I felt like this is going to be the time, it's going to be the year. And now he's out for the year. So that I think that actually is a blow to this team, unfortunately. We don't know what's going on with Kella. I assume it's COVID-related. He, he, he will be in camp at some point in time, uh, pitching and such. So, I mean, that's going to help out, hopefully, because, you know, he's a big part of this bullpen. You know, we lost Edgar Santana, also was potential for this this club. I'm just kind of like with you. Like, I don't feel this division, though, is good enough how I mentioned the Giants are going to be a team that everyone beats up on, right? Like, the Pirates, Mm -hmm. first off, this division, truly the NL Central, isn't that overpowering. Right, we're talking about everyone. We're fighting about thirty-two and thirty-one wins, like essentially with every team. It's not like we're fighting for like a ninety win and ninety-five, a hundred win in a normal season. You know, this reduced sixty games where thirty is the five hundred mark. We're, we're trying to battle if someone's going to win thirty-one or thirty-two. So there's no team that stands out. They get the benefit of playing the Tigers, the Royals, you know, the the White Sox here. It's kind of on the same pace as them. They're young, upcoming, not that great. So I think it benefits them. That 25 and a half, though, is like such a great number. It's hard to really say. This could easily be a 25 win, 26 win team. It's not that they're that great. They're not that bad, but it blows you $100 if that's what you put on this this, this win right here, this total. <laughs> I'm going to go with the over. Um, I feel like this is going to be like the first time in maybe two years I've gone with the over. So maybe I'm bucking the trend a little bit here. Uh, but I'm going to get over two. And again, it's, it's less to the fact that the Pirates, more just this, this is the vision you want to be in. And I feel like everyone's going to be so compact in this division with wins that just because it's so terrible. I mean, no one's happier, I think, right now than the Twins, honestly, looking at this. The Twins are going to clean up in the AL Central. But luckily, we don't have to do those over and unders. <laughs> so, I, I agree with you. That, that plays a big part in my going over as well. Is I mean, the Pirates are going to go an entire year without playing an elite team. <laughs> I, right. I mean, that's there's no Dodgers, no. right? They they no. they don't get the you know get buried by the NL West this year. Yeah, I'm actually thinking about it. What I mean the I mean I, the Cardinals are the only team they're going to face this year who even played in the championship series. There you go. Yeah. Yep. So. 
So this doesn't let's end this. This isn't making us, you know, the the nutting apologist, the front office apologist, the the fanboys here. It's really just the fact that we kind of been just staying with every team and everything. This then this central is just trash. Like no one is going to win. Maybe the twins are the only team that could potentially win anything out of all central clubs, but like no one's going far in any playoff race. It's all going to come down to every West and East and just so happened that the pirates are in there. So lucky for them, they can squeak out 26 wins this year and be satisfied. Jim, anything else you want to add before we let these people go on this fantastic stream we had today? No, um, I think we we covered it. But the next time that we'll get together, there will be a Major League Baseball regular season game going on. So that's awesome. And uh, we'll be able to preview opening day, which will be the next day. There you go. Well, I was going to say, that's why probably, like, people that are going to listen to the podcast, I was holding my fingers and crossing them. Technically, the next time we'll see each other will hopefully be next Wednesday, as it was intended that's for this Wednesday. That um, is true. So, 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 but we would offer a preview then. And then, uh, yeah, like you mentioned next Thursday, when we do the show. We'll actually have live baseball. We could actually be talking about in a week from now, Jim, we could actually be talking about analysis from a baseball game. Might not be the pirates, obviously, but at least we can say, this is what we saw today in this game, which albeit would be Garrett Cole and Max Scherzer. What a game to talk about. Can't wait. Let's, uh, let's hope that it all goes off smoothly. <laughs> let's do it. All right. Well, that being said, we're out of here. We'll see you guys this Sunday, the podcast. And of course, as mentioned, next Tuesday will be Denaro's Dugout with audio. Next Wednesday will be Starbucks with audio and video. And then next Thursday, and it's not live again. So we will see you then. Bye-bye. Later. <laughs>